A good night of Shabbos, everyone. This week's parsha, double parsha of Matas and Masay. At the end of the second parsha, just before the book of Bamidbar ends, the Torah tells us of the mitzvah of Ir Mikla, the city of refuge. City of refuge was a place that a person who was an inadvertent murderer ended up to be able. He was given a, a protection to be able to run there in order that the Goel Adam, that the blood avenger, wouldn't be able to get him. The relatives of the person that he had killed would want justice, and therefore they would look for him, and he was protected inside of an Yermiklan, inside of a city of refuge. And he would stay in the city of refuge until the death of the Kohen Gadol. So the commentaries all wonder, what does the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, have to do with this poor fellow? This fellow ends up killing somebody inadvertently, and his sentence is dictated by the life of the Kohen Gadol. They have no connection with each other. They, are, they don't even know each other. Why is the death of the Kohen Gadol the thing that's going to set this man free? And then the rabbis explain that the Kohen Gadol, had he davened better, then there wouldn't have been an inadvertent murder that took place under his watch, which is an, an incredible concept that the, that the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, is really responsible for the things that go on around him. And had he been on a higher level, so then the ruchnis, the spirituality, what was going on around him, that also would have been on a higher level. Now, since this is the case, that the Kohen Gadol's death is going to dictate when this person is going to leave, one would imagine that people in the city of refuge were pining away for the death of the Kohen Gadol. So, the Talmud tells us of the mothers of the Kohanim Gedolim, they used to make goodies, maybe little shalach bonus baskets, to the right skin, to these inadvertent murderers, in order that these inadvertent murderers wouldn't pray for the death of their sons. What, a, what an odd concept. That you had to worry about the prayers coming from these inadvertent murderers that they were somehow going to be so powerful that the mothers felt that they needed to be protected, their sons needed to be protected against these prayers, and by bringing goodies, it was going to back them off of praying. These were not the most upstanding citizens. This was somebody who needed the message, the lesson that he got by being involved in an inadvertent murder and ending up in an ear miklat. We know that Megaglin Schusa Yedei Zakai, that good things happen to good people, and somebody who is in a rougher position, so then these kinds of things happen to them. It doesn't mean they're bad people, it just means that they're not necessarily the straightest, they're not necessarily the most in control of their lives, and they need these messages. We understand that when a person goes to the city of refuge, he's sitting with Kohanim, with Levian, those from the tribe of Levi, and there in those cities, there is an elevated ruchnis, an elevated spirituality there. You know, there's an amazing thing. We're told that there were three cities of refuge in Eretz Hisol and three cities of refuge in Transjordan on the other side where there were two and a half tribes. And we wonder that how could you have the same amount of cities of refuge in Israel, it only required three. And in a place where there were two and a half tribes, much less people, then you would imagine it would need much less cities of refuge. So why were the three cities of refuge corresponding to the three in Israel? Why were there three of them in Transjordan? And our rabbis say because in Transjordan, on the side of those two and a half tribes, in the Fishi Rosh, there were a lot of murders. But that wouldn't make a difference because just because there were murders, that doesn't mean that there are, there's a need for cities of refuge. A murderer doesn't go to the city of refuge. An inadvertent murderer goes to the cities of ref, city of refuge. So why would the fact that there are murderers dictate as to whether or not there would need to be more cities of refuge. Because in a place where there's murder, that means that life is cheap. And when you live in a place in the atmosphere of where life is cheap, there are many accidents also. Because we're not protected, we're not careful, we're not forward thinking. If life is cheap and it doesn't really matter, in general, if that's the atmosphere of the place that we live in, so then we don't really worry about other people. We're not really, it's not in the front of our minds. And that's why there will be a proliferation of accidents. And that's why there was a necessity to have more cities of refuge. Because the fact that there were so many murders means that there were so many people 
that were also inadvertently murdering and therefore needed to have cities of refuge. Because in the city of refuge, a person got the message of the value of life. They were able to reintegrate them back, themselves back into life. And if that's the case, we're dealing again with people that, that themselves were off a little, that needed, needed this message, needed this education. Why were we so worried about their prayers? So there's an amazing thing that we know that on Yom Kippur, the Kohen God of the High Priest would go into the Holy of Holies. He could only go in once a year, and it would be only him, no malachim, no angels, he and God. And when the Kohen God of the High Priest was inside, he would offer a prayer. And the Talmud records that what was his prayer? One of the things that he said to God was, please God, don't entertain the prayers of wayfarers who are praying to stop the rain. Really? You're inside the Holy of Holies, you could down for anything? You could daven for an uptick in the stock market. You could daven for world peace. You could daven for corona to end. You could do anything. And instead, what are you davening for? You're davening for the wayfarers, the people that are traveling on the road in times where rain would be beneficial to the Jewish people. They would pray so that it shouldn't rain because it mucked up the roads and it made it difficult for them to travel. And therefore, God, please don't listen to those people. Why are you praying for that? Why did the coin God all need to waste his time on that? Because the truth is that the wayfarer has something that perhaps others don't have. The wayfarer has a sincerity and he has a heartfelt need to make sure that it doesn't rain. And therefore his tefillos are incredibly powerful whether he's a wayfarer, whether he's a person with a, a, a concern, it's just a representation of a type of person that has a specific need that might be counter to the needs of the community and might be counter to the needs of the Jewish people. But because he has a need, because he's heartfelt, because he has a sincerity, he has a power to his tefillah, it comes out in the most pure kind of way. And that tefillah is so powerful that that tefillah is nishmas, that tefillah is listened to by God. And that's what the mothers of the Kohanim Gedolim were worried about. That these fellows that were in the city of refuge had an invested, invested interest to get out of the city of refuge. And therefore, when they davened for it, they weren't just puppy through a davening. They weren't just, you know, Baruch Amen, thank you very much. They were davening with such power and such sincerity in such a heartfelt kind of way that those tefillahs would be listened to. And that's why the mothers had to bring them things. The mothers had to get their minds off of those tefillahs, those prayers. Had to take away a little bit of that heartfeltness. They had to take away a little bit of that earnestness. Let them feel it wasn't so bad to be in the city of refuge. So that when they daven, they wouldn't daven with that kind of power. Because we have a kayak in tefillah. When we daven in a heartfelt way, when we daven in a pure kind of way, when it comes from the depths inside of us with sincerity, the power of that tefillah is incredible. But how do we activate that power? Is it just sincerity that we need? I think there's something else. Look at the beginning of this parasha. The beginning of this double parasha is the parasha of Nidarim, of vows. It's fascinating, by the way, it's a bit of an aside, but then we find in the oral Torah, the laws of vows, the tractate that deals with vows, is in the section of the Mishnah that's called, the this, this section is called Nashim. Nashim is those tractates that deal with marriage and divorce. And the rabbis wonder, why would it be, why would it be put there? Of all the places, why not put it in civil law? Why not put it in some other place, in, in Tara and purity and Kodshim and sacrifices? Put it in some other kind of place, because it has a lot to do with temple and temple sacrifices. Why is it put in Nashim, the laws of vows? So the rabbis give a very simple answer, that the reason why it's put in Nashim is because a husband is allowed to nullify the vow of his wife. And therefore, there's a connection to marriage, so it gets put in the section of marriages. 
Well, the only problem with that is, is that that law doesn't appear until chapter 10 of Tractate Nidarim. That's not the main show, the main idea of Nidarim. The fact that a husband can, can knock out the vow of his wife, can nullify that vow. It's a prat, it's a particular, it's, it's a detail. It's not the main game. I'll tell you why I think it's in, in Nashim. Because you know what Nidarim are, you know what vows are? Vows really they underscore the sensitivity to the nuances of speech. Because when you make a vow, if you say a vow, you say this promise, you say this statement in a certain way, then it's meaningless. If you say it in another way, so then it can make something prohibited. It can make something that's perfectly permissible when you say that that thing is like a carbon, like a sacrifice, or that thing is going to be prohibited to me. If it's said in a, in a precise kind of way, in a nuanced kind of way, then it actually lands and it can turn that thing into something prohibited. Words said one way are meaningless, but words said another way are filled with meaning and constitute a vow. Speech gives man an ability to be able to communicate. Speech used in a certain kind of way brings out what's in, inside of a person and brings it out into the world. To communicate well, you have to be aware of the nuances of speech. To communicate well, you have to be aware of the effects that your speech are having. You have to be aware of what your words are, of what the meaning and the implication behind those words are. The basis of marriage is communication. And therefore, a masechta that deals with marriage, that's where the laws of communication belong. Because that's a fundamental aspect of marriage. It's fascinating that marriage is activated by words. We take a ring, we make a kinyan. In most kinyanam, we say nothing, we just lift the shmata, we do something. We move something, we, we, we pull something. But by marriage, we say, because words form the basis of marriage, because words form the basis of communication. And communication is the basis of marriage. In that parsha of Nedarim, in Pasuk Gimel, Perak Lamed, the Torah says, Ish ki yidur nedur Hashem, that a person who takes a vow or makes a swear to prohibit something on himself, so he shouldn't go against his word. Everything that comes out of his mouth, he should do. And Rashi says, what does it mean? They shouldn't desecrate his words. And what desecration means from the word halal is to empty them out. To make them, to make them, to, 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 to take, the, take out the essence of them. To make a whole. You shouldn't be mechalel devaro. You shouldn't desecrate your words. Denude them of their meaning. But rather be careful with the things you say. The Yalkut says an amazing thing. The Yalkut says the Jews are bound by the command not to profane their words, whereas the nations of the world are not bound by such a commandment. And why is that? Because the Kayach Hadiba, the power of speech, has the ability to be able to change the nature of an item. When you make a netter and you say that this object is going to be prohibited to me, this object is going to be to me like a carbon, the object becomes like a carbon. It becomes a shtick iser. It becomes a piece of prohibition. Your words have the ability to be able to change reality. A Nazir who takes a vow with his words, he now becomes prohibited from drinking wine, from touching a dead body, from cutting his hair. He changes his reality. He becomes now a Nazir. You take an item and you say that this item is hectic. This item is for the sanctuary, for the temple. Or you take an item and you say that my property is now hefker. It's ownerless. I give it over to the world. You can change the reality with your words, with your deeper. The Rabbi Nuyayna says that if a mouth can do this, the mouth becomes like a klishares, like a temple vessel. 
that we understand that when you put something into the temple vessel, it becomes sanctified. The reality of it changes. You take flour, you put it into a, a temple vessel, and the flour is now makudish, that flour is now sanctified. When the mouth is like a klishares, it has an incredible power. When the mouth is pure and the mouth is sanctified, then the words that come out of that mouth, then those words are elevated, those words are sanctified, and those words have an incredible power. And that's when tefillah has this power. That's when we can activate this power of tefillah. When the sincerity is coupled with the kedusha sapeh, the holiness of a mouth, then those tefillahs that we say have a power that you can't imagine. You know, I always like to give a muscle. Then imagine you go to the kitchen cabinet and you see a glass. And in that glass is a dead mouse squished into the glass. You are probably not going to wash that glass out. Chances are good that you're going to throw that glass away. Because you couldn't imagine ever drinking something normal from that glass. And if somebody washes out that glass and then puts it back with all the rest of the glasses, you would toss the entire set of glasses. Because how could a glass that had that filth in it be used for something so beautiful as drinking? Something so important and basic. Imagine a Kodesh Baruch. He looks at our mouths and he says that that mouth that just uttered a bracha, but look what that mouth was used for. Look at the things that came out of that mouth. The words of hurt and pain, the Lashon Hara, the negativity. And that's why a person has to be careful. We have to be careful to, to ensure that our mouths are like clay shares. So that when we're in that mode of sincerity, when we can pull from the depths of ourselves these beautiful tefillos, they come into the clay shares, they come into this temple vessel. And then they get propelled up to the inner sanctums of the heavens. That's the Kayach The power of prayer is sincerity coupled with the purity of the vessel in which we use to offer those tefillos. And that's when we have a power. And that power needs to be reckoned with. The mothers of the Kohen, Kohanim Gedolim knew that. The Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur knew that. The Torah understands that. And we need to get that message. That if we want our tefillos to soar, not only do they need to be sincere, but they need to be offered and propelled to the master of the universe in the most beautiful, pure, and holy klishares temple vessel that will ensure that our tefillos will be nishmas, that our tefillos will be heard. In the times we live in, we need every single tefillah. There are gedailim once again that are sick. There are yidin all over the world that are sick. The world is suffering. We need to find that place of sincerity and we need to ensure the holiness and the sanctity of the vessel that we use to offer those tefillos. And may every single one of our tefillos be propelled like a high intensity rocket and be able to pierce through the heavens and may we see peace 
prosperity and health restored back to the world quickly in our days. Amen. Have a beautiful, wonderful, amazing Shabbos.